So acids and bases, we kind of, we've seen these before. So there's no, no compound that we haven't seen. Um, acids, they basically have a hydrogen in front of it. And then the bases, they have an OH. May, most of the time they have an OH, which is hydroxide, which these terms maybe we've seen before. But just to go over what an acid is, and usually something that tastes sour. So when you're talking about very weak acids that we encounter every day and acids that are in our food, um, there's actually a lot of acids in our stomach, which are very acidic. And um, they could, they could actually, there's hydrochloric acid in our stomach. And if we, if we, and, and that's why if you throw up, it burns when you throw up because that's acid. It's actual acid. It's very low pH acid. And we'll learn about pH later. But anyway, they taste sour. Things like fruit, like um, the fruits are mainly acidic and more acidic fruits. You have oranges or any kind of citrus fruit. There's citric acid in there. That's a weak organic acid that um, that's prevalent in a lot of foods. And it's and also vitamin C is ascorbic acid, another organic acid. So um, they taste generally sour. They turn litmus paper red. So litmus paper is this type of paper that's pH sensitive, meaning it's sensitive to the acidity or basicity of a compound. But that's not really too important for now. If we were to do the lab, then that would be important. But for 109, I mean, it's online, so we're not really going to see litmus paper. But anyway, they, so they react with metals to produce hydrogen gas, such as whatever. We might see that. And more importantly, they react with bases to form water and salt. So we will be learning about that reaction today. That's called acid-base neutralization. So if you add an acid to a base, maybe you've heard of this before, they would neutralize each other because one is really basic, one is really acidic. And then when they neutralize each other, they create just plain water, H2O, and a salt. So a salt doesn't have to be NaCl. It could be any kind of ionic thing that we learned about in this class. It could be sodium carbonate. It could be... Um, sodium chloride, it could be potassium chloride, it could be magnesium chloride. So there's a bunch of different salts out there. So any of these um, ionic compounds that don't have hydroxide are really considered a salt. It could be magnesium sulfate, for example, is a, is a plethora of different salts. So then you have bases on the other hand. So bases, they taste bitter, they turn litmus paper blue. They're usually slippery, like um, bases we encounter every day are like soaps or really antacids are the main base that we take to neutralize our stomach acid. Um, that's a fun lab, but too bad we won't be able to do that in person. They usually feel slippery, like uh, salts, baking soda, or not salts, I meant soaps. Most soaps are basic. And they like bubbly. Sometimes they have like, they tend to form bubbles like soap. Um, they react with acid to form water and salt. So you, again, with that acid-based neutralization. So here's an example. So on the left here, you have um, acids. So you have vitamin C, ascorbic acid. You have aspirin, which is an organic acid. Uh, vinegar is an acid. And you, then you have some citrus fruits, some lemon, some orange. That's cool. So yeah. And then you have in the middle, you have bases. Ammonia is the one of the most common bases. And ammonia, and you know that, like the, the ammonia smell. So um, ammonia is in your urine. Ammonia is in... Uh, ammonia is a byproduct of a lot of different breakdown of foods and things like that. Um, so I was watching Gordon Ramsay on the nightmare kitchen the other day. And when the, the food rots, you get that ammonia smell sometimes. And he was like, it smells like ammonia. He started yelling at everybody because they like had rotting food in the fridge. So um, that's also there too. And then you have more and antacids, a lot of different uh, cleaners, soap related cleaners, baking soda, drain cleaner, and then you have antacids for stomach acid neutralization. So those are bases. And then you have some salts. So ammonium sulfate is a salt. This is some kosher salt. I'm not sure which type. Um, then you have Epsom salt, which is magnesium carbonate. Um, so that's a weaker, it's a, that's a salt. It's, kind of, it's technically a weak base, but it's still a salt. Um, but anyway, so here's some examples of acids in this table. Now, what an acid is, according to this guy, Arrhenia, there's a lot of different ways of saying it. But I'll, I'll give you the, the basic rundown is an acid is something that has hydrogen in the front of it or like one hydrogen that can be taken apart from the rest of the rest of the compound, meaning, and then Arrhenius's definition is a substance that ionizes in aqueous solutions to form hydrogen ions. So basically 
a solution or a compound that has a hydrogen and then gets rid of it. Or it can easily, the hydrogen can be easily taken off of the rest of the compound to form this H plus ion. And when you have an H plus ion in a solution, that makes the solution more acidic. So we're going to learn about pH later. And pH, the more H plus ions you have in the solution, the lower the pH. And then the less amount, then the higher the pH. So the H plus concentration determines the pH directly. So it's important that if you have an acid, it has an H in the front of it. It's very important. So here's some examples. You can see that your sulfuric acid, which is the strongest of the common inorganic acids. And it's H2SO4. You see one of these H's would come off when it, when it goes into water. Then you have hydrochloric acid, which is also strong. And the H would come off when it goes into water. Phosphoric acid, which is considered a weak acid. It's not that strong. Um, and, but it's, it's still in high concentration, it can burn you. Really in high concentration, most of them can burn you uh, or feel, um, or be an irritant. Uh, then you have phosphoric acid. So phosphoric acid, there's three H's. So the number of, this is a thing. So the number of H's doesn't necessarily correlate to how strong it is. That's one thing that's important because um, H3PO4 has three H's, but it's pretty weak. Also, see this one, boric acid, it has three H's. That's pretty weak as well. So it, it just, a, the, what determines the strength of the acid is um, the polarity of it. So we learned about that word polar, but I'm not going to test you on that, just in case you want to know, like the polarity of it and how strong the covalent bond is between the hydrogen and the rest of the molecule. If it's a weaker interaction, then it's easier to come off. Kind of like that. Um, so Anyway, phosphoric acid, and you have lactic acid, which is like you've heard of lactic acid buildup, maybe. So those of you who do sports and especially runners, if you're sprinting or if you're running a long distance, the lactic acid builds up and you get that and the, your muscles start to hurt. That's exactly what that hurt is. It's a lactic acid buildup. So that's a very weak organic acid that just occurs in your body. Um, acetic acid, that's another one. This H would come off. Boric acid, hydrocyanic acid, whatever. There's a bunch. But the main idea is they have hydrogen, and when they are put into a solution, they get rid of the hydrogen. Then you have a base. So a base is similar. I mean, it's the opposite of an acid. And what that means by the opposite is instead of, pro instead of producing or have anything to do with hydrogen plus, it has to do with OH minus, so hydroxide minus. Now, something, some a common theme of acids and bases is that H plus and OH minus are antagonistic of each other. They're the opposite. So for bases, it, so let's say for acids, we have hydrogen and we get rid of the hydrogen when we are put into an, a solution. Bases are the opposite. They don't have hydrogen, but sometimes they like to accept hydrogen when they're put in the solution. Or the opposite of accepting hydrogen in this case would be getting rid of OH. So that's exactly what these bases do. They are substances that produce hydroxide, so OH minus, in an aqueous solution. And here are some examples. Most of them have hydroxide, that OH group, but some of them don't, like ammonia doesn't. But um, ammonia also produces OH in water, even though it doesn't have OH. And we'll see that in the reaction. Um, but um, an easy way to make you understand it is so maybe some of you know that water is considered neutral, right? Water is completely neutral, H2O. The reason why water is neutral is because what is water? It's, if you break it down, it's HOH. So it is a combination of one of these hydrogen ions, the acidic part, and mixed with the basic part, OH. So you take half of it is basic, half of it is acidic, then they equal out and they make neutral. So that's exactly why water is considered neutral. It's made of a basic component and an acidic component. And actually water can act as an acid or a base, depending on what it's paired up with or what it reacts with. So if water reacts with an acid, then water becomes the base. If water reacts with the base, then it becomes the acid. So there's a lot of associations you have to make that acids have hydrogen, bases have OH, and they, OH and H are the opposites of each other. Okay, so there's some acids. Now, um, there's limitations of this theory of this H plus 
idea. But and really, it boils down to if you have if you actually go into the water in a molecular level, let's say you put an acid in water, there isn't going to be H plus exactly. You're not going to see oh that's H plus. No, you're going to see that H plus is going to be bound to other water molecules in the solution to make H three O plus. That's called the hydronium ion. It's a cool name. I like that name a lot. Hydronium. That sounds like a good, that'd be a good song name. Hydronium. I don't know. Hydronium something, but whatever. So anyway, that's how it really occurs in the water. It, it would be hydronium. And they basically, in chemistry, we consider H plus and hydronium equivalent because we know when you have an H plus produced in a solution, it's going to make hydronium. So here is an example of an acid equation going, an acid going into water and a base going into water. Another way to look at it, this is all the same definition. So we established now acids have, acids have H want to get rid of it. Bases have OH want to get rid of it. If they don't have OH, they produce it at least. But also the bases like to get H. So they're very opposite of the acid. The acids have H, they want to get rid of it. The bases don't have H and they want it. So that's very important to make that distinction. And thus we can call them, we can call acids proton donors and we can call bases proton acceptors. Now, why do we use proton? Well, because H plus is basically a proton. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen has, look at the periodic table. It has one proton. It has no neutrons since the molar mass is one and the molar mass of a proton is about one. So there's no neutrons. And then it has one electron. So if you have H plus, on the other hand, that means it's neutral hydrogen, but it's plus. So it's one electron removed from it. So if you have one proton and one electron of hydrogen and you remove the only electron it has, it's just H plus and it's a proton. The only thing remaining is a proton. So we can say that H plus is a proton. And we can therefore say that an acid, since it has H plus and wants to get rid of H plus, it's now considered a proton donor. And it donates that proton to the base part of the solution. So in this acid equation, you have H2O. H2O, remember I said it's it could either it's neutral, it could act as an acid or a base. It doesn't have any idea what it wants to do. But it's paired up with whatever it is, whatever it's paired up with an acid or a base. And that determines what it does. So water's like, yeah, whatever, man, I could take a hydrogen. I get rid of a hydrogen. I don't care. It doesn't matter. What do you want to do? Then the HCL is like, I'm a strong acid. I want to get rid of my hydrogen. Can you take it from me? Then water's like, yeah, sure, man. Like, that's fine. So that's exactly what happens. The hydrogen from the HCL goes to the water to make that hydronium ion. And then whatever's remaining of the HCL, which is just Cl minus. So that's an acid equation. Any questions on that? Can you repeat that? Yes. So HCl is, so, um, well, what this, rep what this equation represents is that you're adding an acid to water. So if you would take some HCl and put it into water, this is what would happen. The water molecules would be like, Oh, I don't know what I'm, I'm, I'm not an acid or a base. So I can act as either one. I don't care. I can get rid of a hydrogen. I can take in a hydrogen. What do you want me to do? Then HCl, since HCl is a very strong acid, it has an H in front of it and it happens to be a strong acid. HCl is like, yo, water, take my hydrogen. I don't want it because I'm a strong acid and I get rid of my hydrogens. I have hydrogens and I don't want them. That's what acids do. They have hydrogen. They don't want them. So water's like, yeah, whatever, man, I'm okay with that. So then water takes the hydrogen from this HCl, create H3O plus and Cl minus. So that's how this, we call this an ionization because it causes ions to be formed, H3O plus and Cl minus. So they're both ions. So hopefully that makes sense. That makes sense? Got it. Thank okay, you. cool. Thank you. Good question. All right. So then for bases, it's kind of the opposite. So water is still this like chill dude. He's like, eh, whatever. I could take in a hydrogen, get rid of one. doesn't matter to me. Then NH3 comes along. And NH3 is like, oh, I'm a base. So you know what I want to do? I want to gain a hydrogen. So water, can you give me a hydrogen? Hook me up. Water's like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm good with that. I could do it. So 
the water gives a hydrogen to the NH3, to the base, now becoming NH4 plus, and then remaining of the water is OH minus. This is characteristic of bases and they're called proton acceptors. So again, with the opposite thing that acids have hydrogen, want to get rid of it. Bases don't have hydrogen and they want it. So that's that opposite. Very important. Okay. Any questions on the base part? No. All right. Well, like Kaylee asked if we could do examples of each. Oh. Oh, I didn't see that. Where's the chat window? Oh, there it is. Oh, it was underneath the attendance. Whoopsie. So, okay. Oh, there are questions. All right. So, um, Kaylee, yes. Juan never loses all of them because, so, um, there has, you're right. Water has two H's, but one of those H's is in the OH group of it. The other H is, is the, is the, the lone H. It only loses the lone H because you can think of water as hydrogen hydroxide. So it's two distinct parts. It's the hydrogen part, which it can lose or gain. And then the OH part, which it's just OH. It, it can't lose that or gain that. So think of it as those two parts. And then uh, do we, we even, we, yeah, weak acids give their hydrogen too. But the thing that makes them weak is they don't give all of their hydrogens. So if you have, let's say, 100 molecules, only three of them or five of them will give their hydrogens. So not all of them. Some of them will just stay as they are. So that's what makes them weak. But for HCl, HCl is a strong acid. So every single HCl molecule you dump into the water will get rid of its hydrogen. But if you put in a weak one, let's say acetic acid, only maybe three or four of them will give away their hydrogen. So we're gonna do some more examples. It kind of sounds like socialism. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I haven't thought about that. Good thought, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I'm not, no comment. All right. So um, we'll do another one. We'll do a, a weak acid. So um, well, it's the same kind of equation, but let me think of one. Um, H3PO4. So H3PO4 plus H2O. There we go. All right, so H3PO4, hi, I'm an acid. Water's like, I'm a base, I could, or no, I'm a, I'm a neutral. I could act as an acid or a base. So since you're an acid, you want to get rid of your hydrogen. And then H3PO4 is like, yeah, I want to get rid of my hydrogen. Can you take it? And then he's like, yeah, sure, I could take it. So then this happens. The hydrogen from the H3PO4 gets transferred over to the water and you get H3O plus, plus whatever's left over, which is H2PO4 minus. So that is a weak base. And also, so what this, I'm gonna put a double arrow there. This double arrow, that means that not all of these H3PO4s can react and go to the right side. Some of them are still left over here. Actually, most of them are left over here. So that's just characteristic of a weak acid. We'll see that later on, but um, just, yeah, just note that. Um, now, some of you are thinking, all right, then what about this H2PO4? It still has H's in front of it. Doesn't want to get rid of those H's? And yes, it does. But the way that this works is if you have an acid that has multiple H's, it gets rid of them in steps. And each step has a different level of acidity. So the first H, it gets rid of very easily. The second H, it's really hard to get rid of it. And the, the third H, it's extremely hard to get rid of it. So the first step, it was just get, getting rid of one of the H's. But in reality, if you dump this into water, you would have some molecules that are H2PO4 minus, some that are H1PO4 minus two. Some of them are just PO4 minus three. But that ratio... Determining that ratio is another is usually in chem too. Um, there's a lot of math. To, there's a system of equations to solve to determine that ratio. But um, yeah, just uh, just understand how this equation works. 
And then for bases, let's say we have, <clears throat> um, what's another one? This one's different. So let's say we have NaOH and we add that to water. So what would happen is you're gonna have Na plus plus OH minus plus the water. So in this case, you can't really say that the, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, you can't really say that the base is a proton acceptor in this case, because it doesn't really accept any protons, it just gets rid of its OH. But that's kind of the same thing. You might have NaH form and it will get a proton, but it's very rare. Um, so this, is, this equation is a little bit different than the NH3 one. So NH3 is a weak base, this is a strong base. So usually for the strong bases, the, and the ones especially that have OH, they just get rid of their OH and they form their ions that way. You have Na plus, OH minus, and then H2O. And that would just, H2O would just be there because it can't accept an OH. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Um, it can only accept or lose hydrogens. So, so yeah. Yeah, any, any questions on that? So just the main cons, don't get too crazy about it. The main concepts, acids have the H, they wanna get rid of it. And here's an equation of how they get rid of it. And if they are put into water, the water can act as an acid or a base. So if it's reacted with an acid, it, it, the water is the base. If it reacts with the base, the water is the acid. And just know that the acids lose their hydrogens and they, they have hydrogens and they wanna lose them. The bases have their OHs and they wanna lose them or they produce their OHs, however you wanna think about it. So a good question on an exam might be, um, in this equation, equation one, is water an acid or a base? And the answer would be, oh, HCl, that's an acid. So that means water must be the base. And then another one, equation two, is water an acid or a base? And you'd be like, oh, NH3 is the base, therefore water must be the acid. That's exactly right. All right, let's move on. All right, so then neutralization. So we talked about this already, but when an acid reacts with a base, the properties of each are neutralized and water is made. So if you have, let's go very, very fundamental. If you have the acid component and the base component, right? H plus is the acid, OH is the base. You add those together and you make H2O. So that's why water is neutral because it has an acid component, a base component, and they add up to neutralize each other. So um, here's an example of an acid-base neutralization. So let's add HCl to NaOH. So HCl is a strong acid. NaOH is a strong base. When they add together, what's going to happen? Water and salt. So the water would be H2O because that's, that's what water is. Plus the salt will be NaCl. So I would expect you for these, I would expect you to write the, write the products. So this is, so how do I get these products? An easy way to think about it is you switch the anions or cations, however you want to talk, however you want to say it, you basically switch them. So you take the H and the Na and switch them. If you switch the H and the Na, you get NaCl and HOH, which is water. So we're going to do more examples of this. Okay. So let's take um, H2SO4. That's a strong acid. And we're going to add um, KOH to create something. So this one's a little bit more difficult, but the same thing will happen. So the H will switch with the K and just one of the H's. So remember I said that these acids, they dissociate the H's in a stepwise process. It's usually just one at a time. So we just take one of the H's and we switch it with the K. You end up with K HSO4. So think of that as an anion plus H2O. So this is actually a salt. 
and then this would be the water. Okay, so we'll do we'll do a couple more, and I want to ask for you your guys' opinion or answers. Um, let me think. So you have HBr, hydrobromic acid, and you can add that to calcium hydroxide. All right, so what does it make? Who wants to tell me? You can write it in the chat. Can I take a shot at it? Yeah, sure. So you switch the H and the CA, so you get CABR. Good. Um, and HOH2. Good. So it's not exactly CABR because if you remember the charges, Calcium is two plus and bromine is one minus. So it would actually be CABR2, but you got the concept right. And then the rest of it would just be HOH. And then we have to balance it. So you'd be like, your thought would be, oh, that doesn't make any sense because there's OH2 on the left. Where's the OH2? That's where balancing equations comes in. So the lab quiz. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to do that on the exam because it's not part of this class. It's just part of the lab. But Basically, you would balance it. You would have put a two in front of there because you have Br here and Br2 here. Then you'd have two hydrogens. You'd have to put a two there, and then it's balanced. So good job. And do you see why it's CaBr2? Because of member Br, bromine is in the halogens, which all those halogens are minus one. So the only way for it to cancel out and react with or make a bond with a calcium is if there's two of them. So it'd be CABR2. Good job. Any questions on that? No? All right. We'll do one more. Um, let's do high. That's hydroiodic acid plus MgOH2, magnesium hydroxide. All right. So who wants to give it a shot? Not HMG, because remember we're switching, we're switching them. So the MG would switch with the H. But good try. Good, uh, I'm, okay, so yeah. Yeah, so one is on one. You got it, kind of. I think things are just written in the wrong order. So, yeah. So yeah, Kaylee, that's good. Mg. Yeah, yeah. So, um, for the most part, you got it. But so you'd have Mg. It would actually be I two, because iodine again, it's a halogen, just like bromine. And if you had the periodic table in front of you you can figure this out and we talked about charges already. So you should, you should have that known or at least know where to find the chart, how to find out the charges. But for iodine, you have, it's a minus one magnesium is a plus two. So there has to be two iodines to cancel out with the magnesium. So MGI two plus just water HOH or write it as HOH. Cause if you need to balance it, it's easier. And we can balance it now. So good job, guys. Good job, Juan and Kaylee. Um, so here you have HI. There's one of them there. There's one here. There's two iodines here. So you have to put a two in front of here. So now there's two H's. Put a two in front of here. Same, same kind of balancing as the second one. Uh, and then it's balanced. So yeah. Okay, good job. Uh, so now let's do an easier one. Just to make sure we know what we're doing. So let's do... Um, let's do KOH plus HF. That's hydrofluoric acid. All right, so what would that be? Perfect. Good job, Ash. So it'd be HOH or just water plus the 
K, F, and that's already balanced. So this would switch. The H and the K would switch. All right, good. Cool. All right, so let's move on. So salts, we talked about what they are. They're ionic compounds composed of cations that are not hydrogen and anions that are not hydroxide. So really any other ionic thing that is not H plus or OH minus. And they form with, you know, the neutralization. That's the one that's not the water. And the neutralization is a salt. So, so here's some examples. There's, there's a ton. Silver nitrate, you know, you can read this list on your own. There's a bunch. Yeah, so here's basically what we talked about already is that the acid is the one that gets rid of the hydrogen. It has the hydrogen. It gets rid of it to the base. And then at the end of the day, after the reaction occurs, the base will have the hydrogen. And then these two, these uh, black dots are electrons. So that's how it would work. Okay, so here's something cool. So here's a strong acid and the strong acids and weak acids. So um, strong acids are the ones that they completely ionize. And what that means is if you put in a hundred molecules, you're going to get a hundred dissociations, meaning a hundred HCl molecules means a hundred times you're going to, you're going to have a hundred H pluses and a hundred CL minuses in the solution after it's done. And here's an example of nitric acid. So nitric acid is HNO3. So if you, nitric acid is also very strong. So if you put nitric acid into water, you're going to get a hundred H. If let's say you put a hundred molecules in, you'll get a hundred H pluses and a hundred NO3 minuses. So it dissociates completely as opposed to weak acids. So weak acids only ionize partially in water solutions. And here's one called hydrocyanic acid. So hydrocyanic acid, that's why we have this double arrow because the double arrow shows that even after the reaction occurs, you're going to have some material left in the reactant side of the equation and some left in the product. So if you initially have, so we'll put initial, you have a hundred molecules here. And then before the reaction occurs, you have zero and zero. So after the reaction occurs, you're going to have 98 molecules here, two and two, meaning two of these associate and each one dissociation gives you H plus one H plus and one CN minus, but there's two dissociations. So does this make sense? These numbers, I, I know that these numbers don't add up to 100, but that's because the HCN dissociates into H plus and CN minus. So most of it is going to be in a weak acid. Most of it at the end of the day called at equilibrium is going to be on the left side of the equation, meaning not dissociated or not ionized. Uh, can you uh, reiterate what, what, do you, what you mean by dissociate? Yeah, so dissociate means the H plus comes off or the H plus is removed. So remember the, so the hydrogens are the uh, acids are the ones that have the hydrogens and they get rid of the hydrogens. So this is what we mean by dissociating. The hydrogens fall off there. They come off because the acids, they have the H, they don't want it. So for a weak acid that happens only a very small amount. If you put in a hundred molecules, maybe only two of them would do this. The rest of them don't. But a strong acid, all of them do. So that's the difference. When I say the words dissociate, ionize, that all means the same thing. That all means they, the, the H comes off. So the, hydro, the acids have the H, they want to get rid of it. Okay, so let's look at this GIF of nitric acid on a glove. This is very concentrated nitric acid. It actually burns it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So in my lab, I have concentrated nitric acid like that. I never tried this on my own. I, I should try this. It's a fun experiment, but you notice that he's in a fume hood. So that's something that you need. So I, I, what happens with these vapors you have, what kind of vapors would that be? It's nitrile. So you'd probably get like acetonitrile or like hydrogen gas. You might have nitrate gas. You might have, um, yeah, it might, it's not good. <laughs> Basically what I'm trying to say is 
all the gases that come out would not be good. So you need to be in some kind of hood that vents all the gases. But anyway, that's pretty cool. Okay, so the same thing applies with strong and weak bases. Is that strong bases, let's say you have 100 molecules of NaOH, which are strong, we'll put initial and put final. So if you have 100 of these, at first there's none of the, none of the products. If you react all of it, react NaOH as much as it can go in water, then you'll have zero of these, 100 of these, and 100 of these because all of these 100 molecules will dissociate, meaning the Na plus comes off and the OH minus comes off and they become Na plus, OH minus. And then the weak bases, wait, why not? I just saw your question, so let's not. Wait, oh, oh wait, oh, so, is your question about why there's two and two, like 98 equals 98 and then there's two and two? I think. Um, so I was saying like the AQ, how do you have two AQs on like H AQ and then CN AQ? Oh, so that just means that, so they're, they're all AQ, AQ means aqueous, meaning they're, so AQ is not an element. AQ just means it's in the aqueous state, meaning it's soluble with water. So if that's what you're getting at. So they're just the states of them. If this, if you can get rid of the AQs, they don't really mean anything with respect to the equation. So the important part is the HCN dissociates into H plus CN minus. Okay. All right, so we have weak bases. So weak bases, just like weak acids, they have partial ionization. So if you have NH3 as a weak, weak acid, or sorry, weak base, it reacts with water to create only some amount of NH4 plus ammonium and some amount of OH minus. So if you would do the same thing with initial and final, let's say you have 100 molecules of this. The water, you have a ton of molecules, so don't worry about that. Uh, initially, you have zero product. If you have, but in the final stage, let's say you have, you'd have 98 and then you'd have two and two. Meaning out of the NH3s, out of a hundred of them, only two of them will accept the hydrogen. And then from that accepting of a hydrogen, you'll have only two waters that give up their hydrogen to make OH. If that makes sense, but basically it's a partial ionization again. So meaning not all the molecules, a very small percentage of the molecules will break apart. Okay. So here's the concept again with ammonia. So you see that NH3 will, since it's a weak base, it wants to accept the hydrogen. Water's like, I don't care. I'm an acid or base. doesn't matter to me. Since you're a base, I'll give you a hydrogen. That's exactly what it does to make OH minus. So here's neutralization again. We talked about that. And here's the same thing again. We talked about this equation, but just to reiterate, here's NaOH, which is a strong base reacting with HCl, which is a strong acid. What would happen is the, the cations will switch. It will switch and you'll get NaCl plus H2O or HOH. Now in the lab, we're not going to be doing this, but this would be one of our labs if we had in-class lab that we can monitor a neutralization. So what we can do is, let's say in this, this is an Erlenmeyer flask, this type of flask. In this flask, you have an acid. In this, this is called a burette. In the burette, you have a base. So if you add, and also what you have in there that pink color, purple color is an indicator. And that indicator, it's a, it's a dye that is pH specific. What that means is as soon as the pH of the solution becomes seven, the dye changes color. And that tells you, oh, the solution is neutralized. 
And at that point, you can tell, all right, you can tell a bunch of things, but you can tell basically what the concentration of the acid was. That's called titration, but we're not, we're not, that's a little bit beyond, but you might see it in the lab. But anyway, so what happens is you're adding some of the base, you get a little bit of purple, but then you swirl it around, it goes away. You add a little bit more, you swirl it around, it goes away. You add a lot of base, you see, oh, it's neutralized. When it's pH 7, boom, everything changes color, becomes neutralized. At this point, you know that whatever amount of base I added from this burette was the amount to neutralize this acid. So that's how you can visually see this reaction happening with the use of these indicators. All right, so pH. Now, pH is how we express acidity or basicity of a solution. Now here is the, and it's usually on a scale of zero to 14, but you can actually have negative pH and there's actually an equation for it that we're going to use. Now, here are just some examples of things that have pHs. So if we'll go, we'll start from pure water. Pure water is seven. So right in the middle, that's important to know. Pure water is seven. And it's the definition of purely neutral. Then everything below seven, zero to seven is called acidic. And everything above seven, seven to 14 is basic. And like urine is between five and seven. So it's weak acid, depending on what you eat or drink. If you eat a lot of fruit, then it'll be more towards the five. If you eat a lot of like alkaline substances, they have like alkaline water. That's like a thing that people do now. I don't know. It's one of these like, I don't know, hipsters are into that, but like alkaline. <laughs> alkaline water, um, that, that would bring your urine to like around here, closer to neutral level. Uh, tomatoes, oranges, different kinds of fruits and stuff are usually around here. Uh, gastric juices that's in your stomach. Those are around one to two, uh, Coca-Cola drinks like 2.5. It's pretty acidic. Not good. That's, that's why it bothers your stomach sometimes if you drink too much Coca-Cola or too much soda. Um, and then HCL, like pure HCL, one molar is, zero. And then there, it could be if you have two molar, three molar HCL, like in my lab, we have like the highly concentrated HCL bottles, which are, I think 16 molar, which they're like, their pH is like negative eight or something. It's crazy. Uh, then on the, on the basic side, you have the blood. So our, our physiological pH, that's a term that we use a lot in our research. Physiological pH is 7.4. So your blood pH level should be 7.4. So that's a, that's a good thing to, to know. Um, baking soda, seawater is between there because seawater has a lot of salt in it and the salt helps it become basic. Milk of magnesia, and that's an antacid. Ammonia is like 11 to 12. And then you have one molar NaOH, which is 14. What else was I going to say? Oh, um, good question would be, oh, what's rain? So rain is actually a little bit acidic. So like normal rain that you, that we, we get not acid rain, but normal rain is like between five and six. Then you have acid rain, which maybe you've heard of that. Um, acid rain is between like four and five. So it's not enough to burn you. If you get tomato juice on you, it's not going to burn. Um, but it will irritate your eyes a little bit if you got tomato juice in your eyes. So that's why, but if you get regular rain in your eyes, it's not the worst thing in the world. We've all had rain in our eyes. Hopefully we all, no one, none of us had <laughs> urine in our eyes. All right. Uh, not an appropriate joke, but whatever. Um, okay. That's going to be on YouTube. I'll, I'll cut that part out for future employment. Uh, anyway. So um, yeah. Any questions about the pH scale? No. So it's important. You don't have to memorize question. it. Oh yeah. Your question. Yeah. Um, so, so the only neutral state is seven, right? Mm -hmm. If it's like, if it's like 7.5, would that be considered neutral still? No, good question. Great question. So that's basic. So the only thing that's exactly neutral is seven. If it's 7.4, so your blood is considered basic, it's very weakly basic, but 7.4 it's basic 6.99 it's acidic. So it has to be exactly seven. That's what neutral is. So good question. All right, so how do we determine this pH? Here we go. So this is the pH equation. Now, <clears throat> what pH measures is the amount of hydrogen ions in the solution by this equation. pH equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. 
Now, if you have a low pH, you're going to have a lot of hydrogens. If you're going to have a high pH or meaning basic, you have a little bit of hydrogens. And that makes sense according to what we learned because our acids are going to be low pH and an acid means a lot of hydrogen. Bases are going to be high pH, which means not a lot of hydrogens. And that makes sense because bases don't have hydrogens. So everything we're learning ties into this equation. And we can directly measure the pH based on the hydrogen concentration. Now, this is something you'd have to do on the worksheet and also on the exam and things we have going forward. Oh, Kaylee, good question. pH level of coffee. Um, I think that's acidic. Let's see. So pH level, level of coffee. Yeah, it's a little bit acidic. So it's like 4.8 to 5.1. Good question. So yeah, drinking too much coffee hurts your stomach, right? Why is that? Because it's really acidic or pretty acidic. So those of you who are coffee addicts, don't be or wean off of it. Don't drink coffee. Um, okay. So this equation, it's easy, very easy to use. You're just going to plug in the numbers, but your calculator, it should, you should be comfortable with it on your calculator. So normally what you do is you put in, don't, don't worry about the negative. You put in the log button, usually it's a log button and log means logarithm. So it's a, it's a function. So if for example, the log of one is going to be zero. The log of 10 is one. Um, the log of, it, so the log graph looks like this. So it looks like that. If you remember from math, maybe. So if you have the log of one, this is one, one, the log of one is going to be zero. And let's say this is one, the log of 10, the log of 10 is going to be one. Yeah. So, and then it goes like logarithmically, kind of like increases very slowly. So that's what logarithm looks like. But basically you're going to put in your calculator log and then it might give you a parenthesis already, but if not, you put parenthesis and then you put in whatever the concentration is. So if you put in one times 10 to the negative nine, close the parenthesis, hit equals, it'll give you nine or sorry, it'll give you negative nine. And then you do the negative of that because the equation says negative and then you it would make it positive nine. So um, the way you solve this, well, you, by hand, it's hard to do. You can't, don't do it by hand. Just use a calculator for it. But yeah, so does that make sense? So, I mean, all, all, all for that, you just need to practice. And then here's some examples that if you have hydrogen concentrations and mol molarity, 10 to negative fifth, 10 to negative sixth, you're going to have pH of six, pH of five, because the one is basically nothing because one times something is the same thing. And then the log of this log and 10 to the something cancel out. That's more math proofs and everything, but what log means, it, it's log to the base 10. If you remember that, maybe from high school. So log to the base 10 of 10 to the something, the log to the base 10 cancels out with the 10, if that makes sense. And then you're going to end up with whatever's in the exponent. So if, if our thing was the negative log of 10 to the negative 5.6, then our answer, the log and the 10 would cancel out. Our answer would be 5.6. But sometimes you won't get 10 to the something. Sometimes you might get 2.5 to the something. So in that case, you'd have to do it in your calculator. But I'll leave that to you. Here's some charts that we just seen already. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, just the, some definitions of things. So hyperacidity occurs when the stomach secretes too much acid. Now, if you have food that doesn't agree with you or food that you're not used to eating, or maybe a, a meat that wasn't cooked enough, what happens is your stomach tries to compensate for it, to neutralize it, to, um, to digest it. So it secretes a lot of acid. Sometimes that acid might be too much and you have acid reflux and then that might cause heartburn. So some of you maybe you've heard like, Heartburn. I used to, when I was little, I used to think heartburn was like a heart problem, but it's not. The reason why they call it heartburn is because it feels like there's a burning around your heart. 
But in reality, all that is, is the acid coming up your esophagus because your esophageal lining is not strong enough to withstand that acid. Meanwhile, your stomach lining is very strong and could, because since there's acid in your stomach right now, um, the stomach lining of your acid, the stomach lining of your acid, the acid lining, the line, the mucus lining of your stomach is acid repellent or it doesn't, it's not affected by acid, but your esophagus is pretty weak. That's why uh, if you have, well, if you drink anything acidic, it's going to burn a little bit, but I mean, alcohol is a bit different. I mean, alcohol is like stronger alcohols. It burns because ethanol burns, burns your stomach or burns your esophagus because it also, does, it also reacts and dissociates, but that's different. Um, anyway, so what you're going to do if you have this problem of heartburn is you take antacids to neutralize it. So like Tums, milk of magnesia, stuff like that. And then if you have excess antacids, like too much of them, then it can increase the blood pH and it's, it's called alkalosis. You can actually overdose on antacids and die. I don't know. I never heard of that happening, but it's a lot of them. You have to eat like a lot of them and it happens, but here, here are a bunch of the antacids. And if we were in class for 109, there's this cool lab where we compare the strengths of all of these different antacids in, with this method, with the, where is it? With the titration, with this kind of method, but damn COVID can't do that. Anyway, so here are some antacids. You don't have to memorize them at all. Just know that that's a thing. Um, and acid reducers, kind of the same thing. And then you have acids and bases could be used in industry. So soil can be sweetened by using calcium hydroxide. Sure, that's, that's possible. I don't really know too much about that. And the sodium hydroxide, that's very important for... Um, for oven cleaners, drain cleaners, and things, any kind of heavy duty cleaners that are like toxic, like the, the ones that you like a lot of Cloroxes and things like that, like really strong cleaners, um, unless they have bleach in them, they usually have, well, bleach is a base too, but they also have other strong bases like sodium hydroxide, things that are, that can take away all that mildew and stuff. Ammonia. So used for fertilizer. That's why if you ever hear like, um, my mom has a garden and like the animals, they pee in the garden a lot, like squirrels and stuff. Right. And that's good for the garden because it fertilizes the ground because there's the ammonia in there. 